Good morning, everyone. What a delight it is to be together. I, I still, I'm kind of pinching myself. Um, during the past two years, every Sunday I walk through this, uh, this, little, um, this little theater and it's empty. And I was just, I've been dreaming about this, this very moment when we'd be back together again. And I, I can't think of a better guest to have for our first time back. Um, it's such a gift that we're all here. Um, good morning, my name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Welcome to the forum, and thanks for joining us for our first in-person forum since March of 2020, 20, of 2020. Can the wisdom of Celtic spirituality help heal the earth, overcome our conflicts, and reconnect us to the sacredness of the earth and one another? My guest today is John Philip Newell. He is a Celtic teacher and author of spirituality who calls the modern world to awaken to the sacredness of the earth and every human being. In his most recent book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, he writes, quote, the crises that we are in the midst of today, whether ecological, political, or societal, stem from the fact that we treat the earth and one another as less than sacred. Every year, the cathedral chooses a theme for inspiration and reflection, and in 2022, our theme is connection. Today, we are talking about how an earth-based spirituality can help us rediscover our connection with God, with each other, and with the earth. So good to have you. You know, when I was reading this a year in December ago, I, um, every single week for like weeks, I would preach something that had something to do with this book. So uh, if people didn't realize it, but they're getting a little preview. <laughs> but I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just the pandemic. Um, and maybe you could talk about what you learned. Um, and then also maybe what you think we as a society learned during this, during this very difficult time. Mm. Thank you. And may I say how very good it is to be here and to be with you. Malcolm, yeah. Thanks for the welcome. Yes, the pandemic has, has been for, for me, like for so many of us, uh, a time in which I was forced to let go of normal rhythm, normal teaching patterns, normal pilgrimages to Iona. And uh, when we're forced to let go, um, I think we're also given an opportunity to ask, uh, well, what's it going to look like when there's the opportunity to, to resume much of what we're, we've been doing? And uh, so for me, and, and I pray for, for us uh, as a society and as a, an earth community, we may choose not, we will choose not simply to go back to the, the pace uh, to to, to the lack, lack of awareness that, that often dominated the fast pace. In Edinburgh, uh, early in the pandemic, uh, we were hearing birdsong in the city like I've never heard it before. And the, this is a relatively unpolluted city, but the, the skies were so much clearer. Uh, there was more, much more sort of gathering out in the, in the beautiful parks of Edinburgh rather than in the sort of crowded pubs and of the past. And my, my sense is that some, some of that alertness to how we want to be in relation to one another and in relation to the earth will, will continue. And uh, so for, for me, I'm... Uh, paying attention to how my my f forward going schedule can can reflect that sort of learning, and um, that's my prayer for for us as well as the world. Yeah, it's funny. There are just a lot more surfers in the water. Um, one of the things about the pandemic was that for that first section it was Ill, kind of illegal to surf. So and I was not completely sure whether it was illegal or not. But yeah, basically yeah. you'd park like a few blocks away and kind of sheepishly walk through the neighborhoods with your surfboard and there was no one in the water, and it was amazing. And now um, there, are real, there are a lot more people in the water, and um, it's because people's work, I think, they can rearrange when they do it. Yeah. And so if they're passionate about surfing, they can be in the water yeah. more. So yeah. in a way, it's funny, because I, I know many of my fellow surfers find it frustrating that there's more people competing <laughs> for the same number of waves. Yeah. But I, I, you're right, in a way it is a sign, kind of a spiritual sign of where people are, yeah. um, a, a, a new spiritual growth, a new recognition of things that are important. Yeah, and um, we don't do much surfing in Scotland. We, we don't have those 
those wa the same waves, but there's been a great movement towards wild swimming. Oh, yeah. Uh, so again, you know, m many are, are into the sea, yes. uh, which, is, which is a fascinating uh, phenomenon or expression of what has happened during the pandemic, that uh, it's been important for people to reconnect with the wild. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The wild and in themselves, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, I um, taught our confirmation class. It's so wonderful. These young people, they're, they're so full of hope. And um, a large part of our conversation was about um, just uh, like what the difference is between a child's faith and an adult's faith. And uh, it, they were extraordinary. I'm looking forward to want to get invited back to meet with them. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just like different phases of faith that we go through in life. I mean, maybe your own and maybe kind of what you see generally too. Mm. You can imagine the scene. I mean, well, all of us were so glad to be together. They're uh, you know, inquiring. They're curious about things. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, you know, five years ago, uh, almost six years ago, I was elevated into a new uh, um, status in the universe. I became a grandfather. Oh, yes, right. Person. That's great. And um, so I, I think that that gift of, of grandchildren, uh, as well as the, the memories that I hold of fathering my own children, but the, the grandchildren have been bringing an awareness of the child uh, and the child and me, I mean, I think they, they help release, they help me get back in touch with, with the child. Um, and um, I'd, I'd love to, to uh, watch the grandchildren uh, together uh, because they, they enter the, the imaginal world often. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be made in the image of God, to be made of God, is, I believe, to be made of the great imaginer. And I, I love what Thomas Berry, the eco-theologian, <clears throat> says when he says, the universe is so amazing, uh, it must have been dreamt into being. Yeah. And then good, good prophet that he was, he, he said, um, and we are in such a mess, hmm. ecologically, politically, religiously, uh, we are in such a mess that we need to dream the way forward. <clears throat> we need to allow ourselves to imagine uh, ways of being, ways of seeing, ways of, of relating that we've never known before. So that child and the, the, the imaginal that we entered so sort of naturally as, as children is still within us. Yeah. Uh, and how, how can we reawaken it in one another? Um, one of the uh, things that I've uh, that my my two two daughters uh, are the are the mothers of the grandchildren, <clears throat> and they've communicated to the grandchildren that uh, that my study is 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 sort of sacred space, yeah. <laughs> and um, so when the grandchildren come, they you know they knock on the door. And, and when I'm able to invite them in, if I'm not sort of absolutely in the midst of something, they sort of enter, whoo, <laughs> you know, the study. And um, uh, a little while ago, I, I was away when they were in the family flat. And I came back, and um, there were sort of cairns of stones oh, all over great. the place in my study. And, and um, it became clear that, <laughs> that they had been in there sort of using their imagination to, I don't know, you know, you know how the child loves to, to quite naturally create almost like ritual. And um, so it was like, almost like these little uh, miniature prehistoric cairns of stones that they had taken from my pile of Iona stones. So um, next time they were, oh, and then after, after discovering these cairns of stones, I, I Turned on, tried to turn on the light switch, and it's one of these dimmer switches, and the light the lighting wasn't working. And I thought, oh, I think there's a connection between <laughs> the, the this play and the study and the, the the switch not working. So next time little Ember was at the flat, I invited her into the study, and I said, uh, Ember, were, were you in here the other day? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was an, it was just totally, you know, no, no sense of shame or hiding. And, um, and I said, were you, were you doing something with the light switch? Yes, yes, we were. <laughs> and I said, what were you doing? And she was saying, well, we were turning it. In. Light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. <laughs> um, so I, I, love, I love the child, um, this open-eyed, um, the imaginal, but also the open-eyed. And I think that that's, that's very much uh, the urgency with which we are being called again back into the imaginal, that a part of, part of what we need to do is to play the way forward. Um, I think there's been a lot of inhibition in our culture and in our religion about trying new articulation as if, as if there is a right articulation of faith or the, as if there is a fixed and final you know, liturgical or creedal statement or whatever. And I think, um, I think we need to keep playing yeah. and not get fixed because the child doesn't, doesn't get fixed. Uh, That's so, I love that. So it's almost like the development is um, from the childhood, that imaginal self, to getting more fixed and then it's becoming more imaginal again. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like coming back to our childhood roots. When, when you were speaking, I thought of two great sections of the book that I absolutely loved. One was, um, I think it was George McLeod talking about his daughter coming into his study on her first day of school. And um, she comes in, he's busy writing very important letters, and she interrupts him and says, today's my first day of school. And he says, well, your tie's not straight. And, um, and he just saw from her face just how, um, how deflating that was. And he said that even though he instantly, when he saw the expression on her face, I mean, it was a, a revelation, right? I mean, an epiphany. When he saw the expression, he did everything right after that, like went, went and brought, went downstairs and got her ready and, and walked with her to school. But he could never forget that first look that she had when, she first, when he first criticized her when she walked yeah. in the office. Yeah. The other section... He, he finishes saying, I'm forgiven. Yes. But I won't forget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Forgiven, but won't forget. And then the second section is the section on Pelagius. When you talk about um, Pelagius um, saying, you know, when Pelagius says the child is holy, um, just not uh, um, the, the, the child, oh, I even wrote it down. It says what, uh, the, child, what is, the child is an example of that holy, um, and the, his, his, uh, his conclusion that he drew from that is, he said, what is deepest in us is of God, not opposed to God. And I, I love that too, that just children help us to realize that also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the... Um, it, it, this has been part of the response over the years to, to my uh, attempt to reclaim Celtic wisdom uh, around the sacredness of the newborn child, uh, but not just the sacredness of the newborn child, but of the sacredness of what is first or deepest in us, uh, being of God rather than opposed to God. And um, again and again over, over the years, as I've tried to... Um, communicate this, this vision, re-articulate it for today, uh, people have come up to me and said, you know, I knew it. Or, right, you know, right, exactly. <laughs> that what you're, what you're articulating, I may not have heard it before. But I intuited it. may not have it. been taught to it. Exactly. But I know this. I yes. know this about uh, the, the child, for instance. And... Um, so the, the child can, can definitely be part of waking us up again to, yeah. to those depths. When you talked about, as soon as you started talking about the imaginal, I was thinking of there is a way in which as I'm drifting off into sleep, I, I do step into another world. And actually, maybe it's more deeply into this world yeah. where I stop being so concerned about just like the day-to-day -day tensions between human beings and um, just experience that awe of, of, of existing, especially in this beautiful this, on this beautiful planet that we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and and that you know that's to point to the the relationship between that uh, that drifting into that sort of liminal space between wakefulness and sleeping and dreaming. Uh, and I think the same the same experience it characterizes meditative yeah. awareness. That uh, it it's that. Um, letting go of being uh, captivated by many of the details of the conscious realm and the 
the state of wakefulness and being attentive to some of that, that deeper realm of the unconscious or the, the, the realm of un, unknowing and, and what, the glimpses in, into that world of oneness and interrelatedness. Uh, that's deeper than the, the conscious realm of differentiation. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it, and, it, you know, is it any, um, is there any sort of surprise about the fact that most great religious traditions have, have celebrated those liminal times, those transition okay. times between night and day or between day and night and celebrating the twilight and the time of the two lights, you know, neither governed neither by the day, the sun, nor by the moon, but this, by this sort of meeting right. of the two lights. And, um, and I think that's part of what we're, so many of us are searching for, to bring our spiritual practices uh, back into this deeply natural rhythm of, uh, of day followed by night, uh, of the, the rhythm of uh, of, of a 24-hour period and the rhythm of the seasons. Let's, let's allow our spiritual practices to be guided by, by those deep and eternal rhythms of, of earth rather than um, so often tragically uh, seeing that what happens within the four walls of our cherished spaces somehow doesn't have an immediate relationship to or guidance by uh, what the Celts call the, the great cathedral of earth, sea, and sky. Um, and, I, and I think at one stage in our uh, historical development, the great Gothic cathedrals and so on were, were inspired by the proportions of nature. And I think we need to become conscious of that again, to sort of recover that, that uh, deep connection between the great sanctuary of God and our, and our cherished spaces of meeting. You know, it's one of my favorite things about Grace Cathedral, which I wish I could tell people about. So many times I'm sitting there and thinking, this is a phenomenon that you only see between October 12th and November 17th. Do you know what I mean? Because there, there'll be a disc, you know, um, or the, the, we even have a, 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 like a, there's a nick in one of the stained glass windows. And so um, when the sun passes through it, at certain days, you can see this like little disc on the, on the pillars. And I want to tell other people about it. I'm, I'm so glad someone told me about it. But it's always in the middle of a church service, and it's not like really appropriate to say, look at the pillar. <laughs> Uh, but the Grace Cathedral, it has that. Yeah, you know, and, and, and you can tell what time of season it is um, by how the light filters through the stained glass windows. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, this wasn't a question that I thought of ahead of time, but as we were talking, I, I, I have Michael Pollan uh, is, lives in Berkeley and wrote a book called How to Change Your Mind about psychedelic drugs in general. Yeah. Um, but um, people sometimes ask me what my take is on you know, entheogens, like drugs that you use to have deeper religious experiences. And I, I, I never feel like I have a very satisfactory a answer. And I wonder if people ask you that question or if you've given much thought to that whole thing. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been graced with the opportunity to have uh, relationship with native traditions, First Nations people, yeah, and most most nat most uh, indigenous spiritualities have have accessed the realm of altered state of consciousness, um, whether through peyote or um, other other means, and um, and I think a lot of um, a, a lot of what happens, for instance, in the native uh, s sweat. Uh, tradition mm. um, is uh, not ingesting a anything to lead us into an altered state of consciousness in that state. But I think the ritual itself and, and the heat and the demands of, of a sweat lodge sort of um, not allowing us to sit upright, but sort of <laughs> in order to survive one's sort of head being burned off, there's <laughs> this sort of reconnecting to the earth. So I think whether, whether it's um, uh, for, you know, forms of um, plant-related use or whether it's ritual, I think so much uh, spiritual tradition is about uh, consciously accessing uh, what can uh, change our our um, 
change our state of consciousness, how, how it can sort of open us up. Uh, and, and I think that's exactly what you're, what you're pointing to earlier in, in sort of letting go of, of um, being dominated by the, the details and, and shape of the day as you're drifting into sleep. And I think the same, the same thing is true in uh, seeking altered state of consciousness. Uh, so I, I think that um, my, my experience with, with native traditions on, on that front is, is an extremely positive one. Um, and it leads me not, not to be primarily suspicious or frightened of, of that route. Um, I mean, I think with any, with any uh, pursuit of altered state of consciousness, I think, I think we also need to be careful. Um, we need to be sort of protective of the well-being of one another. Um, and we need to ask why, you know, why we are seeking an altered state of consciousness, because the, the imaginal I see is a realm that can lead us more deeply into reality, more deeply into the truth of our interbeing. Um, and I would, distinction, I would uh, distinguish that from, from the realm of fantasy, uh, which I think can take us away, away from reality. So like all of these gifts or um, um, ways that we are offered, I think we need to keep discerning um, is, is the use of, 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 a, of a, a means of altered state of consciousness an escapist energy uh, or desire in me and in our community, or is it, is it with the desire to remember what we've forgotten? Uh, and that is the deeper realm of, of interconnection. Um, so that, that, that's always my, my take on anything we, we choose. Let's discern together um, whether, whether we're being led to the heart of the truth of, of our Christian household, the truth that Jesus embodies, uh, leads us further into. And that is, are, are these practices, um, do these translate into compassionate action? Do they translate in, into love uh, for one another and the earth? And, and uh, if they don't, then let's be very wary. You know, if, if it's primarily self-indulgent escapism, let's ask questions and... and um, and be prepared to say no. Yeah, that's another thing you say in here too, is you, you talk about Pelagia saying, your idea of God or your idea of Christ is much less important than whether you're actually living like Christ. Yeah. Uh, and it's, in a way, it's the pragmatic test of truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it's, I, I, um, I think even in our yoga practice on Tuesday nights, there is something about that physical activity that puts you in a, like, I don't know, more, more open frame of mind. Um, and doing it in, in community with other people is, I think, part of what makes it effective. Yeah. yeah. I think it's great that that's happening here. It's an expression of, of the bigness of, your, uh, of, of the vision that grace is often reflected. And, and it's, it's doing that important piece. Um, one of my teachers uh, was Bede Griffiths, oh, uh, yes, the right. Benedictine who spent most of his life in India. And he, he wrote the his most seminal work, I think, was The Marriage of East and West. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important that we find ways of... Um, he, the way he put it was we need to strip uh, Christ of, of his Western garments and allow him to be clothed in some of the meditative practices and wisdom of the East. And, um, and it's, it's important that we do that individually. Many people are doing it individually. Uh, but ma many, uh, uh, many who are doing it individually are often in a state of exile from their Christian inheritance. And I think to do it collectively or to do it in our very sanctuaries is, is part of the creative way forward. It's about bringing back into relationship what has been torn apart, and that is um, East and West, not to speak of many of the other polarities mm -hmm. that have uh, characterized a dualism in, in so much of our Western Christian culture and tradition. Yeah, that's true. I, I wonder, I mean, you've had so much experience just in cathedral life. 
I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just about the unique mission of cathedrals um, and just what their contribution can be, especially now in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I think the, the um, medieval cathedrals in Europe were in origin um, centers of great uh, study, uh, artistic excellence and, and imagination. Um, they were places of teaching as well as uh, spiritual practice. And it's, it's that combination that, that I think is so important. Um, the, these centers of, of, um, of study and artistic expression so uh, my sense is that at, at this point in time, as so much of uh, Christianity as we have known it is collapsing uh, in outward form, uh, what is trying to be born? You know, what is trying to come forth in a new way? Um, what, what, is, um, what is the sort of resurrection um, energy with, with, uh, from deep within our tradition? And it's important, of course, to always remember that resurrection is not about resuscitation. It's, it's never about uh, trying to revive what was. It's not about making uh, our religion great again. Um, yeah. And uh, so in this time when, when, I mean, one of the chapters in, in the book uh, is on the French Celtic teacher, uh, Pierre yeah. Terre de Chardin. And one of the last things he, he wrote uh, in New York was uh, Christianity is at the end of one of its natural cycles of existence. Uh, it needs to be born again. And in this born again Christianity, he said Christ will no longer be seen as a deserter of earth. You know, this notion of salvation, right, Jesus right. and Christ almost airlifting us into salvation. Christ will no longer be seen as a deserter of earth. He will be seen as lover mm -hmm. of, of earth, at one with the earth. <clears throat> so in this time of a collapse of, of so much uh, of, of what we have known Christianity to be, um, I don't think we should, uh, we should primarily get into a sort of shoring up or trying to resuscitate what we have known so much as to be open to what we don't yet know or what's trying to be born, what's trying to rise within us. And my own sense is that the cathedrals will play a, a critical role in, in that resurrection, in that, in that rising. Um, and whether it is, whether Christianity increasingly takes the form of house gatherings and more, um, more intimate gatherings of, of study spiritual practice and action. We will, I believe, need these great gathering places. And I think that the cathedrals um, offer that. They have, they have, that's part of, their, um, uh, part of their deep identity historically. Uh, and I think that, that, that they'll be able to play that in a, in a new way to do in a, in a sort of bigger scale expansive, more inclusive way, um, what, what more intimate, smaller gatherings will, will not do. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's such an important moment for cathedrals right now. And mm. I think cathedral congregations, too, have just a unique mission of hospitality. I, I, I think there's a way in which um, the people at Grace Cathedral are here because they want to serve um, pilgrims, basically, who are coming and going. And um, and in people in the city too, who, who when they in, are in trouble, they, they, they oftentimes come here. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a it's a much freer uh, space to enter as well uh, than than uh, than many other religious structures or smaller parish churches. I think cathedrals have have that um, uh, aspect of, of of greater openness and accessibility. Uh, which is one of their gifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so many people ask me, they say, what is Celtic spirituality? And I, um, I have my own little answer for it. But I would love to hear your answer because it might help me and make my answer a little better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, uh, Celtic, uh, I think one of the things that's important always to say is Celtic spirituality is, is a new term. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not how, you know, these great prophetic teachers that I refer to, people like Pelagius and Eugene and St. Bridget and others, <coughs> they, uh, they didn't refer to themselves as sort of teachers within Celtic spirituality. So this is a modern term that we use to refer to a particular expression of, um, of Christian wisdom that emerged in, in Celtic territory and that emerged very much um, in resistance to the heavy hand of empire and of uh, the religion of empire. You know, when Christianity gets into bed with empire in the fourth century, um, it, it is under enormous pressure to teach what is convenient to empire. Yeah. And uh, so in the Celtic tradition, which, which in many ways um, gave, uh, gave expression to a sort of spirit, uh, spirituality of resistance to power, um, it, it was uh, consistently a tradition that celebrated sacredness of earth, and sacredness of every human being, or what is deepest in every human being, and thus the title of the new book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. Right, right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the, and these, the, the, these, of course, are interrelated, um, that we are of Earth and of Earth's sacredness. But this has enormous implications. Um, you know, one of the first doctrines that was articulated by, by imperial religion in the fourth century was the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, mm. in which it was taught that a distant creator, uh, a transcendent being, uh, fashioned matter out of nothing. Right. So Irenaeus, uh, whom I write about, the second century teacher from, from the... Um, the Celtic world of Gaul, said that uh, creation doesn't come out of nothing. Uh, creation comes out of the very substance of God or comes out of the womb of God, uh, which is to say that this stuff, the stuff of our bodies, is sacred stuff. And how we handle one another in relationship is a sacred matter and how we care for the bodies of those who are hungry and homeless. These are sacred matters, how we handle the matter of the earth with, with reverence and with justice. These are sacred issues. So um, when imperial Christianity articulates the doctrine of creation out of, out of nothing, uh, part of what that doctrine did was attempt to neutralize matter tried to say that matter in itself is not, not sacred. It, it's not from, from the essence of God. So Irenaeus uses this word that is still, I think, shocking to our dualistic Western ears when he says, this all comes out of the substance of the divine. Mm -hmm. um, so on that front, um, the, the Celtic stream, mm -hmm. very early on and then consistently over the centuries, as, as speaks against any tendency to neutralize matter. And similarly, um, someone like Pelagius, who you've already referred to, um, uh, is, is teaching that what is deepest in every human being is of God. Therefore, uh, the wisdom of God, the creativity of God, the love longings of God are to be uh, looked for, expected, uh, served, uh, set free, uh, deep within the people. So, and again, empire has, hasn't liked that approach. <laughs> I mean, empire has preferred to, to dictate or to uh, dispense uh, how, how to live and to behave and how to see. And it's often in a very limited way. It's about serving uh, our, our well-being at the expense of other nations. And this has been true of, you know, this was true of the Roman Empire. Um, it was, it's been true of the British Empire. 
it's been true of the American empire, to the extent that we ever behave towards uh, the resources of the earth and other nations and people of the earth as if they are there primarily to serve our well-being uh, rather than to serve the, the well-being of our, of our oneness or of our interconnection. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I was at a dinner with a, a, a group of younger clergy uh, on Sunday night, and we were talking about preaching. And I, I wonder if you can, um, what, what advice you give to people who are just starting out in preaching. And I also wonder just what advice you have to all of us who hear sermons. Um, like, if, is there a particular frame of mind that we should be in? Or, um, you know, so it's kind of a two part question. Mm -hmm. Well, in that I'm about to preach, I suppose I, I would say uh, it's important that people listen. <laughs> <laughs> Especially this morning. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, I, so maybe I could start with the hearing of sermons because I, I have this very strong sense of, of communication being always relational. And uh, one of the things I've so missed over the pandemic time it is this in-person gathering. Uh, because I really like, uh, it's important for me to see the, uh, the light in people's eyes when I'm trying to teach or, or to preach. And it's also very instructive for me to see when people's eyes glaze over. <laughs> you know that, so it, it, it's, um, it's a mutual responsibility. I'm, I mean, I may be the one trying to articulate but it seems to me that uh, it, is, it is a mutual event. So how, how can we, in any gathering, whether, whether it's in a religious gathering or not, how can we, when we are primarily in listening posture, how can we be um, communicating to the speaker that, that we're present, that, that this, is a, this is a time of, of uh, intercommunion, really? So uh, that's, that's much more from the, the sort of receptive end. I think um, from the preaching end, uh, I, I see a, a, a real difference between teaching, which I do most of, uh, I mean, I do more of, uh, and then preaching. I, I see them as very distinct uh, forms of, of, of trying, trying to serve one another, um, and so I, th I think that the whether we are preaching or whether we are teaching, and I, I think that the the preaching mode is often a, an opportunity to um, to to do that twin prophetic thing that is so deep and rich in our in our Christ Judeo Christian inheritance. And that is to, to both announce, try to announce uh, a vision of truth, and to denounce uh, what is false, right. both within our household of religion, but also within our political sphere, within our national sphere, with, within the individual uh, sphere of relationships. So I think we, we have to um, do this it's important to do this uh, the announcing of vision and denouncing of what is false. And I think that the preaching mode is, is particularly um, designed to do that. But I think whether we're preaching or whether we're teaching, uh, one of the important things that I've become increasingly aware of and that I would like to, be, to, to, to always be reminded of by those who love me and, and, um, and can be part of shaping who I am and what I say and do. And that is to be reminded that, um, that any uh, wisdom that we're offering uh, is already in the heart of the, of the listener. Yeah. So I'm not dispensing uh, truth from above, which I think has been the shadow side of a lot of hierarchy of religious teaching. Um, I'm not dispensing. I should not ever see myself as let me tell you. <laughs> right. uh, but rather, in, in my words uh, and in any vision that I can articulate, to, uh, 
to pray that, that those words can release, uh, liberate, set free the wisdom of, of the divine that is already in my listener. Uh, because the, those that we are addressing in sermon or in teaching, they're made of God. Yeah. Um, and and deep, deep within them is, is this um, wisdom of, of the divine. And, you know, um, Ecclesiasticus says, um, wisdom was fashioned with us in our mother's womb. Right, right. Uh, so it's there. And, and any, uh, any forgetting of that is, is a dangerous um, arrogance that will, will, will not serve. It won't serve anyone. It might serve the self-satisfaction <laughs> of the person thinking that they're dispensing it or giving it. But I think it won't translate into, um, into a depth of uh, transformative uh, behavior and relationship. Um, yeah. yeah, again, it's like, by, by their fruits ye shall know them. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, um, before the pandemic, um, I was invited to lead a pilgrimage to, like a, to Iona and to different places like that. Um, and, uh, you know, everything got put on hold. Um, but you know, I, I, there, I was definitely undertaking it with a little bit of reticence because I, I just didn't, I didn't feel qualified to lead a pilgrimage. Um, but I wonder if you can teach us a little bit about pilgrimage, um, what role it can have. I, I mean, of anyone I can think of who I know, you probably know more stories about people whose lives have been transformed by pilgrimage than anyone I can think of. Mm. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about just how pilgrimage works in the modern world. Yeah, I, I, I think we're in a time of, um, of a renaissance of pilgrimage. And this is, this is one of the practices that, that we have deep within our Christian household. Uh, and I think we're, we're seeing it rise up in a, in a new way, new expressions today. Uh, so a, a couple of things about pilgrimage. One, one is that one of the terms that was used for pilgrimage in the ancient Celtic stream was the word peregrination. Right. And uh, the pe peregrines, the pilgrims, um, those who wandered, uh, were um, one of the expressions of it, uh, of the peregrini, is that the peregrini or pilgrim is someone who is seeking their, their place of resurrection. Mm -hmm. They're seeking the, the new beginnings. And I think that's, that's often uh, deeply part of what's, what's happening. You know, when, when people make a long journey to a sacred site like Iona, um, no one happens to pass through Iona. It's not on the route <laughs> an anywhere. It, it, it's it, not the hub for it, United Airlines. No. <laughs> it's, a, it's a destination. It's a very intentional destination. And it's a long journey, sort of plane rides, train rides, ferry rides to, to get there. So I, th I think by the time people arrive, they've often done this letting go and often arrived uh, with a very open heart, ready yeah. to receive. And uh, that's, that's such an important aspect of pilgrimage in, in my experience, that when, by the time people arrive on Iona, um, th they, they're you know, generally extremely open mm -hmm. to receive and to, to experience their resurrection to experience a new rising of what is deepest in them, made of God. And one of the features of pilgrimage on Iona <coughs> that I've I've been alert to, and I try to I try to cherish cherish it in terms of how we shape pilgrimage. Uh, in the sixth century, these Celtic monastic communities, uh, they, they all had sort of unique rules, distinct rules, because there wasn't a hierarchy, there wasn't a, a center of authority in the Celtic world that was telling everyone you know, how, how they should live or what rules. So each monastic family, in a sense, had their own rule. And there, there was sort of likeness between the monastic communities, but it wasn't a sort of uniformity. And in Columbus, 
uh, community on Iona in the sixth century, there was one aspect of the rule of life that I haven't been able to find in any other cultic monastic community of that time. <coughs> and that was Columba uh, instructing his community uh, to pray until the tears come. Mm. Pray until the tears come. And that's a beautiful reverencing of the place of tears, uh, of the inner lens of the heart, uh, the inner lens of seeing, uh, being washed or, or cleansed. And tears, often, uh, tears will uh, often come either in times of intense uh, sort of beauty and loving, or they may come at times of deep suffering mm -hmm. and loss. And uh, the tears, whether of, of joy or of sorrow, or of beauty or of, of struggle, uh, can, can do this cleansing, uh, can do this washing of the inner lens so that we see in a new way. And, you know, maybe that's, that's been part of the tears of the pandemic. The, you know, why, why is it we're, we're especially grateful to be in one another's oh, company yes. and to be in person? Is <laughs> because uh, the pandemic has allowed us to see in a new way and to see with such gratitude for uh, being together in ways that we've, that we've had to, to deny ourselves of. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have met so many people who have arrived on Iona unaware of this rule of Columbus community in the sixth century, but who have said to me, when I stepped foot on this island, I began to weep. Mm. And uh, that, that's a grace of, of that island. And, and you know, why does, it, why does it happen in particular places? And uh, I think there's a sort of a cumulative energy to places. And, um, but I think there's also, there are certain places in the body of the earth, just as there are uh, places of greater sensitivity in the human body um, that, that invite particular awarenesses and responses. So I, th I think Iona is one of those thin places um, um, in, in which the um, distance between heaven and earth or spirit and matter is, is as MacLeod says, it's as thin as gossamer. Um, and, and these great uh, pilgrimage places, these great thin places, um, are not places to stay in. Um, I mean, some stay, you know, stay long term there. But I think they are um, places that that help us return to home territory and to see the thinness of every moment and to see the, th the thinness of, of, of every context. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of our traditions is we um, take questions from the yeah. audience, um, which we've forgotten about. I mean, so, so this is the first <laughs> question in two years. Um, but, but before we get to this question, I, I had a, another one. This is a, um, a tough one. Um, so, so I mentioned I spent the day yesterday with a friend who, who, who's basically facing a surgery. Where, 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 it, there's a 50% chance he'll survive the surgery and everything will be great, but a 50% chance that he'll die as a result of the surgery. Um, I wonder just, um, just through all your experience as a minister and as a teacher, um, and just uh, how to be present for somebody who's, who's in that circumstance. Um, what is it that you ask that person or say to that person? Mm. I remember uh, years ago, one of my uh, dearest friends was diagnosed uh, with cancer. And um, as I was walking to visit him in hospital, um, crossing a couple of parks to get there, um, to begin with, I, as I approached the hospital, I was saying, what, what am I to say? Um, what can I say? Uh, and thank God, by the time I got to the hospital, I realized it's not, it's not a matter of what I say. Yeah. It's a matter of being, being present to him. Yeah. And, um, and, th th and that was liberating, because I knew I could be there. Right, right. Uh, and it's I, one thing that we can I, all do. I, I knew I could be there in love. And, yeah. in, and 
making that, that connection between the heart of my being and the heart of his being. Um, and, um, yeah, so that, that, that's how I approach, uh, 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 try, to, try to approach it, to remember uh, that, you know, we've already touched on this in, in the what do we offer as teachers, at, and, and whether it's as teachers or as pastors or as um, lovers of soul, you know, in the Anamkara tradition in the Celtic world. Um, our, our role is just, just to try to uh, uh, release uh, what is of the divine and the other. So any, any you know, peace that the, that, that the one we love is, is being challenged with in, in terms of the journey of cancer, uh, uh, it, it is, um, it's only a, to the extent that we can release that, that peace of the divine and, and one another, I can't somehow um, deposit it into you or, or place into you um, what I think you need. Uh, so much as try to try to release the the peace of the divine. Um, a couple of months ago, I, I got to, uh, I I was able to be with my younger sister as she as she passed, and uh, and she asked if I would speak the words of peace, uh, the beautiful peace prayer from the from the Hebrides, deep peace of the running wave, to you. And um, and I I felt at that that moment that that those the words of peace that I was speaking were again simply there to try to articulate or further release in her an awareness of of the peace of of the sacred that she carry, mm. carries within her and that she did she did carry within her. Yeah. Oh, that's a lovely. Thank you. Um, so, so we're starting to get lots of questions. Um, thank you. Um, given your clear wisdom about uh, announcing um, what it is, what is true, what might I have said on the bus yesterday when a couple announced um, that he cherishes, what he cherishes about Donald Trump is that he reveals the truth. Okay, so I'm sorry, my eyesight's getting worse. I <laughs> one big change from COVID. But yeah, so, so um, how, what should this person's frame of mind be um, after having overheard this conversation on the bus about liking Donald, truth, Donald Trump because he reveals the truth? It's a good question. I, I, I don't know how I'd answer it myself. Yeah, we, I mean, we have the same challenges on the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, what is it we are trying to do? I think one of the um, some uh, movements of great vision for justice and for change uh, often get derailed um, or undermined by a self righteousness, self righteousness in the movement. Yeah. Uh, for you, you know, some uh, somehow um, in our passion for for. Uh, what is what is true, um, or a passion for transformation and change in a nation and a society, uh, we begin to sort of over-identify that truth with ourselves and and call the other to to become like us, yeah. which is the definition of self-righteousness, I think. And um, so, how, how do we keep uh, returning? You know, in, in the Christian tradition, we, we, we have, um, we're being constantly invited by Jesus into a place of humility. Uh, and so what does that mean? It, it means to me about um, being grounded again in the, in the, uh, hu in the humus, in the, in the earth, in, in the, uh, the, the ground of the divine deep within us. And, and part of that journey of being grounded again and, and again in the true ground of my being in what the Celtic tradition refers to as the soul within my soul or the light within the light, uh, with the life within all life, 
is to do this sort of shedding um, of the way in which the ego is forever trying to claim center ground. Um, and that's not to put down the ego, that's not to diminish it. The ego is this amazing faculty of consciousness and willpower. Uh, but the ego uh, is given not to be the center, it's given to serve the center, to, true, to serve the true center. So how, how can we be that in, in the face uh, of, uh, of, of, of those who we may, may most passionately disagree with in, in terms of how we shape our nationhood, how we, how we uh, shape our relationship with Earth? Um, how the earth is to be reverenced, how the feminine is to be reverenced. So uh, there's a shadow form of masculine power uh, uh, that, that has expressed itself on both sides of the Atlantic that arrays itself against the earth and over against the feminine. And, um, so how, how, do we, um, how do we face and call to change um, those who were... Uh, most passionately in disagreement with. And um, for, for me, um, one, one of the, and I'll be touching on this today in the, in the sermon, uh, one of the great uh, figures uh, that, that challenges us is Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so when he took on the wrong, the falseness of the British Empire and dominating India, uh, he he just he refused to call them his enemy, mm. uh, and he was forever um, looking to address the true heart of the leadership of the British Empire, uh, because he believed that the, the true essence of every human being is of uh, is of the divine, is of the sacred. Uh, it may have. Um, the, the other may have taken on sort of monstrous or distorted forms that are untrue to their depth. Uh, but uh, our role is to keep sort of calling the other back, back to the essence of, of their being, uh, to become truly themselves, not to become like us. Um, so, uh, and, the, and then on the question, you know, how, how do we assess uh, what truth is? Uh, for me, as a son of the Christian household, it is always about uh, is, is uh, our sort of visions of teaching or of nationhood or of, of how we structure ourselves politically. Um, is this enabling us to, to truly love one another? Yeah. Or, or is it um, uh, a, a way of structuring, a way of living that is um, uh, seeking the well-being of only some and, and, and not also the other. Um, so uh, there's, so, there's so much that could be said on that important question. And I love the way in which m many of the Celtic teachers will always refer to the Satan figure, um, not, not to equate Trump with the Satan figure. <laughs> Um, but uh, even, even when speaking of, of the Satan figure, they refer to him by his true name, original name, Angel of Light. Mm. And they say he's false to the extent that he's not being himself. Yeah. He's false to the extent that he's not being what he was created as, Angel of Light. So how do we address even those whom we most disagree with and are disgusted by the policies of, how do we address them as brother, yeah. as sister, right. of light? <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so the next question, oh, we're running out of time. Um, do you consider yourself a mystic? Uh, you know, I, I had a letter the other day in which uh, someone asked me if if I considered myself a heretic. <laughs> um, and my response to that was, no, I don't consider myself a heretic. Um, you know, people may choose. I don't think, think of you as a heretic either, pe just pe so you people, know. <laughs> people may choose to say, say that about me, but I think I sort of feel the same way about the mystic, although in the case of the mystic, I, uh, I honor many mystics. I love mystics. 
Uh, but it's not a term that, that I would ever claim for myself. Uh, I think that I, um, one of the things I've loved about the Celtic stream is that they are alive to the mystical. Uh, so if, that, if that's what a mystic is, then of, of course I want to be part of that. Um, but I think, it's too, I think it's too much to claim, to claim that. I, uh, I'd be surprised if any of the mystics were actually claiming that for themselves. But how, how do we encourage one another to open up to the mystical, uh, to, not, to know not just with the head, um, uh, but to know also with the heart and to see not just the phys to see the other not just in terms of their sort of physicalness or outwardness but to know them essentially as as spirit and the, and, and I think that that's what the mystical uh, mystic um, and the mystical tradition is alive to seeing um, uh, Henry David Thoreau, the in, his, in, yes. in his journal, was um, he received a survey, and he was supposed to fill in the survey of what his scientific interests were. And um, in that, he described himself. He's like, well, if I really were to tell the truth with this, they, they just it would blow their minds. I can't even tell them the truth, <laughs> because the truth is, I'm a mystic also. Um, and so it, 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 it's funny. It's a funny word, but it was his way of saying. There are accepted scientific ways of knowing, and then there are other ways of knowing too. Yeah. And that he was committed to the scientific ways of knowing and committed to these other ways of knowing also. Yeah. Um, and I, it's funny, when you were talking too, I was thinking about how some people think of, I'm not a saint, you know? Whereas I, I do think that in our tradition, you know, we regard all of us as saints, you know? So it's not like there's these people who are set apart from us. Yeah. Um, so I, I think about that part too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, maybe we've, we've used the term as uh, an exceptional case. Yeah. Rather than, uh, and I would prefer always to say we're, we're all being invited into the mystical. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to stop, but we, can't, we have to stop because you have to have a little bit of time to rest yeah. before you preach a sermon. <laughs> I know that. I just, you can't go right from here to, to preaching immediately after. Um, but what a pleasure. I mean, I, I feel like I have so many more questions. I only asked you like <laughs> about 20% of the questions I actually had. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a gift to have yeah, you here well, today. It's good to be with you. Oh, to be with you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Please join me um, on Wednesday, March 16th, when my guest will be Daniel Darling. Daniel, as the spokesperson for National Religious Broadcaster, pro Broadcasters, lost his job after writing a column for USA Today about his decision to get vaccinated. We'll be talking about courage and civility in this divisive time. You are, of course, always welcome to attend the Choral Eucharist upstairs at 11 o'clock. I'm looking forward very much to um, John Phillips' sermon today. Um, we rely on your gifts to the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can give as you leave or on gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 76278, 76278. And thanks again to um, John Phillip for joining Thank us today. You. Thank you.